Good afternoon, everyone. I'd also like to very warmly welcome you to today's EBI webinar. My name is Katja Luck, and I'm a group leader at the Institute of Molecular Biology, which is in Mainz in Germany. Um, and so, yeah, I've been studying proteins and the interactions throughout my scientific career, and I hope that I can pass on to you today some of my passion and excitement for proteins and the interactions. And I want to teach you some of the basics for how we can use protein interaction data for biological discovery. So why should we actually care about protein interactions, right? Isn't it all about the genes? Don't we always say, oh yeah, gene X functions in process Y, like the gene P53 functions in apoptosis, for example. Well, if you think about this sort of uh, sentence for a second though, then, well, it's kind of weird, right? Because how can a stretch of, of DNA really exert a function like apoptosis? And you can say, yeah, of course, it's not the stretch of DNA, right? It's the product of the gene, which is often a protein that then functions in a process like apoptosis. Okay, fine. But um, if you think about this one more second, then how can a molecule on its own really exert a function? Well, you might know, or you certainly know, it's not the protein on its own, right? It's a protein that engages uh, in interactions with other molecules, often other proteins, and it's these interactions that then really mediate the function of, of the gene. Uh, and so I really like to see this ensemble of all molecular interactions that, that actually mediates all cellular function and organization. And it's the perturbation of this network by mutations, pathogens, or toxins that can actually cause disease. So, you know, we like to draw these protein interactions as these cute little balls that are connected with these links here, right? But of course, we know that protein interactions are much more complicated and complex like that. In fact, you know, proteins um, can either interact with each other in a binary way, so two proteins binding to each other, but they can also engage in larger protein complexes, as shown here. It can also involve other types of molecules like DNA. And in these protein complexes, you can have direct contacts between uh, two proteins, but they can also sort of indirectly associate with each other. Now, what is it actually that makes two proteins to bind to each other? But from this beautiful, but very like reduced representation of proteins as these helices and strands, you can't really see what makes it that they bind to each other because we are hiding all the atoms, you know, from the amino acids uh, that are, these proteins are made up by. And it's these non-covalent contacts uh, between these residues that really determine interaction. You know, these contacts can be hydrophobic, uh, there are polar contacts, or charged contacts. And it's really the, the entirety, the sum of these attractive, but also repulsive uh, contacts between these residues that determine to which extent the, the two proteins will actually interact with each other. Now, from this, it follows that um, uh, actually these two proteins are in, in, in an equilibrium between two states, right? They are changing back and forth between the unbound and the bound state. And the ratio of these two states actually expresses how strong the interaction is. So this is a dissociation constant, also called binding affinity. And from this equation, it kind of follows that the interaction strength is actually a continuum, right? So there's no natural cutoff um, that would define uh, whether two proteins interacting with each other or not. Any cutoff that we use uh, is very artificial. Um, and is often determined based on the interaction assay that we're using to detect a protein interaction. Well, you could say though, yeah, fine, but can't we just say that actually interactions, we can define an interaction based on whether the interaction has a functional effect. So it's functionally relevant. And so, so to say an interaction that doesn't have a functional effect, therefore is not an interaction. 
But in theory, we could try to, to do this, to discriminate binding from non-binding. Um, but in practice, this is really impossible because just because an interaction doesn't show an effect in the system you're looking at, you know, it could just be that you're not looking at the right cell log context. So what we know though, is that um, the stronger protein interactions actually often function in the core biological processes as part of very conserved protein complexes that are also called molecular machines, like the proteasome, the ribosome, the mediator complex, et cetera. However, it's also been shown that these very strong and conserved interactions actually form a minority of the protein interactome. And the majority of the interactome is actually rather formed um, by sort of weaker interactions that uh, more often function in regulatory or cell signaling processes. However, there is this correlation that's been found that actually, um, um, you know, um, the functional relevance, let's say, um, is sort of in or correlates with the conservation of the interaction. And with that, I really think that, you know, it's kind of amazing to think that uh, all life really depends on the proper formation and dissociation of these very dynamic, you know, protein complexes and interactions. And so from that, at least for me, it logically follows that, um, you know, we should um, be able to learn a lot about biological mechanisms if we're using protein interaction data in our research. But, you know, what are actually the questions that we can try to answer um, um, using protein interaction data? Well, for example, um, we could predict the function of your gene of interest using protein interaction data. Uh, we could also try to understand whether your protein of interest is actually part of a known protein complex. Or if you found that your protein of interest uh, causes a certain disease, you can use interaction data to see whether it's somehow functionally related to other genes or proteins that are also linked to this disease. Now, if you did a genetic uh, screen um, and found that, for example, 20 genes, your candidates from this screen, rescues, uh, rescue a certain phenotype, then you might wanna know whether these genes uh, have some functional relationship to each other. Do they tend, for example, to interact at a protein level with each other, which would mean that they might work in the same biological process. And finally, you might wonder about, you know, if your protein has many interaction partners, does it mean that it is really important for cellular function? Now, um, to answer these questions, what we need, of course, is ideally a comprehensive set of protein interactions or a protein interactome data set. So how can we get a protein interactome data set? Well, an analogy to that, you know, if you think of the genome or transcriptome, then you know that we have great technology, uh, thanks to next generation sequencing, to very easily nowadays obtain the genome sequence or the transcriptome from your sample with great sensitivity because we have PCR that can amplify even the lowly abundant DNA molecules in your sample. When it comes to the proteome, well, we have mass spectrometry as also very nice technology to give you all the proteins in your sample, albeit that will be at a reduced sensitivity. And that's because we have no PCR for proteins. We cannot easily amplify the lowly abundantly expressed proteins in your sample, and they more often drop out you know, in the measurements. When it comes to the interactome, then we have to say that unfortunately, there's really no technique with a sufficient sensitivity that would be able to tell you all the protein interactions that exist in your sample. And that's because you know, we have no PCR for interactions. We cannot amplify or somehow stabilize the, the weak and lowly abundant interactions in the data set. And also interactions, as I told you earlier, and they're not a molecule, right? They are a state uh, between two proteins that are non-covalently interacting with each other. And so even though we don't have you know, um, a method at this point that can capture the protein interactome in your sample, of course, researchers have developed a plethora of different assays 
to still detect protein interactions, even though at a like reduced throughput, let's say. And this is just a snapshot of even more interact and interaction detection assays that exist. And so we can very roughly group uh, these different assays into three categories based on the type of interaction data that they generate. And these are methods to detect direct interactions, binary interactions, or co-complex interactions. Now methods to detect direct interactions are based on the expression of two proteins, A and B, in a cellular system, often bacteria, uh, because you then want to break uh, open these cells to extract these proteins, to purify these proteins, and do measurements in vitro using you know, some often complicated uh, machines, like, for example, isothermal titration calorimetry. And so the the important point for these sort of types of measurements is that because you only have protein A and B in your sample, if you detect an interaction, you can be sure it's a direct interaction between protein A and B. But oftentimes these me um, methods only work for fragments of proteins and not full-length proteins uh, because full-length proteins not, you know, not, don't purify very well. And so in the second group of assays um, to detect binary interactions, we also start off you know, with a cellular system where we overexpress oftentimes uh, two proteins, A and B, as fusion constructs. And these fusions enable us to detect or have a readout for the interaction, usually in an intact cellular system. I'm showing you here as an example, a very famous method to detect binary interactions, which is yeast to hybrid. Yeast to hybrid is based on the expression of protein A and B as fusion constructs to the DNA binding domain and the activation domain of the yeast transcription factor. And only if protein A and B interact with each other is this transcription factor sort of functionally reconstituted and can activate the expression of a reporter gene which the yeast cell um, needs to grow. And so the readout of this assay is cellular growth. And we call this, this data that's generated here as binary interaction data, because you take two proteins and test them for interaction, but not all of these interactions are necessarily direct because you cannot exclude the possibility that other proteins in you know, the cellular system you're using here might be bridging the interaction between protein A and B. And so finally, um, you know, the third sort of big class of uh, methods um, are all there to detect co-complex interactions. They're usually based on the idea to pull down your protein of interest, either using uh, um, an antibody that's specifically rised for your protein A, or you express protein A as a fusion construct with an affinity tag. You can use that to pull down protein A, and then oftentimes you couple this to mass spectrometry to detect all the proteins that are associated with protein A and that you can purify in this process. Um, now here, of course, you will find proteins that are directly contacting protein A or that are indirectly you know, associating with protein A in the same complex. All right, fine. So how do we know get now, get now though from all these individual sort of uh, interaction detection experiments towards an interactome data set that we need to, to answer the questions that I sort of introduced to you earlier. Well, one of the most so common or widely used methods to do this is literature curation. This is a process where, you know, of course, scientists who have been doing all these experiments to detect individual protein interactions have published their work and then we have other scientists, so-called biocurators, um, that now extract manually oftentimes this information about the interacting proteins from these publications, curate them and put them in public resources that you certainly know. Those are like BioCrit or Intact, for example. Now, based on what you have learned now about all these different methods that exist to detect protein interactions and a different type of interaction data, that they are generating, you can certainly now imagine that the data that is available in these um, resources here is very heterogeneous. And you, know, you can certainly now easily imagine that 
um, depending on the question you have that you want to answer with the protein interaction data, only maybe a subset of this interaction data might be applicable uh, to your question. So for example, uh, you might only want to use direct or binary protein interaction data if you're interested in studying interfaces between interacting proteins, as it, as it has been done recently, for example, in the Burki et al. study, where they used alpha fold to predict the interfaces uh, between interacting proteins. On the other hand, if you're interested in studying protein complexes, you might only want to work with uh, interaction data that you generated from co-complex assays. Um, another example would be that if you want to just study direct contacts between proteins that are in a complex together, when I look at the intersection of um, sort of interaction data generated by these three different approaches, or if you just want to study broadly any function relationship between proteins, you might as well use the union of all interaction data available uh, from these resources. Now, finally, if you just want to look at the more stable or stronger interactions, you can filter the interaction data set for those interactions that have been reported multiple times or been identified by you know, different assays. Now, there's two more points um, that I want to make to you about literature curated protein interaction data. The first is that actually the vast majority of the data uh, in INTACT, for example, uh, comes from co-complex uh, interaction detection methods. And that's good to know because if you work with the entirety of interactome data uh, from these resources, then there's a, you know, uh, a dominance uh, by you know, the presence of co-complex interactions. And the second point I wanna make is that, um, well, we know that you know, the human proteins or genes are not, all, are, are not all equally well studied. This is shown here in this graph where we ranked all human protein coding genes based on, on the number of publications. And then just for presentation purposes, we binned all these genes into bins of about 500 genes. Then you can see that there's a few genes that have been really highly studied, so more than 500 papers mentioning that gene in the abstract. But the vast majority of actually human protein coding genes is still very poorly studied. And this, of course, leads to the problem that um, for the more highly studied proteins, <laughs> we also have you know, much more interaction data being detected and curated and put into these literature curated interaction data sets. So there's a huge bias for interaction data towards the most highly studied proteins. And for the vast majority of this interactome space, we still have very little interaction data available. Now, partially to overcome this uh, study bias, a few methods to detect protein interactions have actually been pushed to a point where they can be applied at a scale that allows to systematically map protein interactions. And so on the binary side, there's yeast to hybrid, which can be done and has been applied at a scale where 17,500 human proteins have been systematically tested for interaction against each other. And this generated a data set um, of more than 50,000 binary human protein interactions involving about 8,000 proteins. And as you can see, this data set much more uniformly uh, covers this interactome space with interactions. And this data set is called HURI for Human Reference Interactome, and it's available at this dedicated website here, but also via INTACT. On the other side, uh, we have affinity purification coupled to mass spectrometry, which has been applied to more than 50,000 uh, human proteins um, to perform these pull and experiments. And this generated a set of more than 100,000 co-complex interactions involving about 15,000 human proteins. And this resource is called Bioplex and is also available at its own website and for search and download on the BioCrit uh, resource. All right, so now that we know these different 
resource that we can have at hand to get protein interaction data, we can come back to, um, to these questions. And I actually wanna focus on the last question first and see how we can use protein interaction data to look at you know, whether there's a correlation between interaction partners and the number of interaction partners and how important that protein would be for cellular function. Now, um, this question has actually been asked a while ago already um, by Laszlo Barabaji and his group, um, where they actually took um, a literature curated uh, yeast protein interaction data set. And they found indeed that um, proteins of a higher number of interaction partners tended to be more essential uh, or upper knockout, more lethal or detrimental to the yeast growth. And this has really been a landmark study that has been cited many times since its publication. However, I've also shown you earlier that actually, um, you know, literature curated data sets, we have this kind of study bias where we have way more interactions being curated for the more highly studied proteins. And so the question comes up whether, you know, essential genes, you know, are they maybe also more highly studied because we have just a higher interest in understanding them? And if so, would that be, would it mean that then we just have more proteins being curated for these essential genes? So could it be that um, this amazing relationship between lethality and centrality in protein interaction networks is just confounded by study bias? Now, to answer this question, we actually looked at um, three different ways to define essentiality in the human genome. Uh, the first one is lethality here, which is based on mouse lethal screens and then mapping this to the follicles proteins in human. We also use the loss of function and tolerance measures uh, that we could extract from the exact database. And we use data based from, so from CRISPR knockout screens from the DAPMAP project that we call here fitness effect. And then we see here correlation mat matrix between these different essentiality measures, as well as the age of genes, how well a gene has been published and how abundantly it is expressed. And as you can see this red color, all of these features are highly correlating with each other, uh, meaning that essential genes are indeed more highly studied, but they are also more highly expressed. As you can see here, uh, more highly expressed genes also tend to be more highly studied. Now, we then um, looked at uh, five different um, human protein interaction data sets. Uh, the first one being the systematically generated binary interactome data set HURI. We then looked at three different systematic generated co-complex interaction data sets, and you've seen Bioplex already before. And we looked at a literature curated protein interaction data set called LitBM. And here we investigated to which extent the degree of the proteins in these networks, the number of interaction partners, correlated with how well the protein was studied or how well it was expressed. And as you can see, um, we see a significant correlation for the systematically generated co-complex interaction data sets and for the literature curated uh, protein interaction data set. We think, however, that this apparent correlation between publication um, and degree for the systematic co-complex interaction data sets is probably driven by an underlying correlation for expression abundance, because we know that mass spectrometry has this tendency to much more easily detect more abundantly expressed proteins. We then used um, um, a correlation uh, correction uh, method to sort of uh, subtract the effect from the underlying expression and publication bias from a correlation between degree and these essentiality measures. And we observed indeed that in most cases, the observed correlations weakened or even disappeared. And so the take home message from this analysis essentially is that, you know, all protein interaction data has uh, some bias that influences the number of interaction partners that are detected or reported for a given protein. 
So if you want to use protein interaction data to investigate a correlation between degree and gene property like essentiality, then you should definitely check your data sets for potential confounding factors. All right, and so with this, I'd like to come to the second last question uh, where I wanna show you how you can use protein interaction data to investigate whether a set of genes or proteins tend to interact with each other. So to, to look at this, we would first need a measure that kind of tells us how close my candidate proteins are to each other in a network. And here's a toy example. I have a large network in which I have my 12 candidate proteins being highlighted here. Um, and so there's sort of two measures of closeness I wanna to introduce to you today. Uh, one is you can just count the number of interactions between your 12 candidate proteins. And the other measure would be to determine the average shortest path between your 12 proteins. How can you do this? Well, the shortest path between two proteins, just the shortest connection or shortest number of links you can find to go from one protein to the other. And so you can determine this shortest path for any two, any pair of proteins among your 12 candidate proteins, and then take the average of these shortest paths. All right. Um, so for our, my candidate to my toy network here, that would mean that there's like 14 interactions between my 12 candidate proteins and the average shortest path between these is 2.17. However, I, you know, I wasn't really asking how um, close my proteins are in the network. I was asking whether they tend, tend to be close or tend to interact with each other, which means are they closer to each other than like a random set of 12 proteins in the network. So can I just sort of compute this trend by randomly taking 12 proteins and then count again the number of interactions between them or the average shortest path? And if that is sort of different, I would then know that my 12 proteins uh, tend to be close to each other. The question is, can I just really randomly take any 12 proteins from the network? No, not quite, because um, it could be that your 12 candidate proteins actually might have on average a higher degree, so a higher number of interaction partners um, than the rest of the network. And if two proteins have a higher degree, they also by chance tend uh, to interact with each other more often than proteins of a lower degree. So what you would need to do, you would need to actually randomly sample 12 proteins um, that have the same degree distribution like your 12 candidate proteins. But this is actually computationally quite hard. And so what we can do instead is we, you know, don't need to randomly sample the proteins, we can actually randomize the network instead in a degree controlled way. So that means that we have, for example, our toy network here, and we would just shuffle the edges in such a way that every protein maintains the same number of interaction partners, but which partners it has is sort of rewired, okay? And if you really want to use this approach, you don't have to code this yourself. There's actually, for example, the iGraph package that exists in R and Python, where you can use a degree sequence, um, which would exactly do this for you. All right. So um, if you now come back to our sort of toy example, so we would see in the real network that our candidate proteins have 14 interactions and average this path of 2.17 we would now generate a high number of degree-controlled randomized networks. And then in each of these randomized networks, we would again compute the number of interactions between the 12 proteins or the average shortest path. And then we can sort of plot this. We can plot from these randomized networks the distribution of the number of edges between my 12 proteins and compared to this, my observation from the real network. 
And if your 12 proteins indeed tend to be close to each other in a network, then they will have a higher number of interactions compared to what you would observe in the randomized networks. And the same is of course true just inversely for the average shortest path where you wanna see that u proteins are having a shorter average shortest path in the real network compared to the randomized networks. And this sort of approach to compute uh, trends, connectivity trends and networks has been used, for example, in a study um, from the Barabashi lab published in 2015, where they defined disease modules in a protein interaction network based on you know, how close certain genes are from the same disease. And then they investigated relationships between different diseases based on how close different disease modules were to each other in this protein interaction network. In another study published by the Vidal lab, we actually uh, looked into um, how or whether tissue specifically express proteins tend to interact with each other. And while the dominating thought in the field was that tissue specific proteins would actually interact with each other, we found that in most cases, in most tissues, these specifically expressed proteins actually did not tend to interact with each other. All right, um, so this um, brings me back to the questions you wanted to look at. And now I would like to jump to the first question. And I wanna show you how we can use protein interaction data um, to predict the function of my gene of interest. Now, actually the approach that we will use here or look at is called guilt by association. And that's sort of based on the hypothesis that if my candidate protein is close in the network to proteins that are working in a certain biological process, like apoptosis, for example, then there's a certain chance that my candidate protein will also likely work in apoptosis in this example here. So this is called guilt by association. And so if you want to now investigate whether my candidate protein indeed uh, tends to connect or tends to be close to other apoptosis regulators, then what we simply need to do is we can again measure how close my candidate protein is to apoptosis proteins in the network using, for example, the average shortest path measure. And we can do the same thing in decree controlled randomized networks to observe whether uh, my candidate protein indeed is closer to apoptosis proteins compared to randomized networks. We have applied this approach onto uh, the HURI network to identify novel apoptosis regulators and one of the sort of top hits that appeared was the O2 ubiquitinase 6A. Now, O2-6A is a pretty much uncharacterized proteins that we actually found to be close to quite some apoptosis regulators. And indeed, when um, doing a cell death assay, we observed that um, higher expression levels of O2-6A actually correlated with a shorter time until death. Now, if you look at the second and third question here, where we wanted to ask, oh, is my protein actually a part of a known protein complex or does it, uh, is it close to other disease genes? Well, we can actually um, answer uh, these questions in a very similar way that I just uh, explained to you, um, looking at these apoptosis uh, regulators. We can also, um, do this randomized approach and just see whether my protein is closer to proteins in a given complex compared to what I would observe in randomized networks. And so with this, I'd uh, like to come actually to um, my summary slide. So, and yeah, just summarizing really the key points that I hope you can take home today from this webinar. The first one is that, you no, know, I think it's now clear that um, really protein interactions matter because it's them uh, that mediate really the functions of genes. Uh, we have seen that protein interaction strength is a continuum. So any distinction into binding and non-binding is somewhat arbitrary and often just assay dependent, dependent on the sensitivity of the interaction assay you've been using. 
Literature curated protein interaction data is a great resource to get protein interaction data for your research. Um, but you should know that it is, you know, very heterogeneous in the type of data that it contains, and it has this bias uh, towards the most highly studied proteins. Um, now, there's also uh, more and more systematically generated interaction data sets that are appearing, and they are really complementing essentially more and more literature curated interaction data sets. And, and sometimes they might be more appropriate for some questions you want to study. I hope I uh, convinced you or was able to explain to you uh, that you really should carefully consider which protein interaction data or data types you want to use according to the question that you have. Um, and you should keep in mind for all of your analyses that protein interaction data is confounded um, and the degree of proteins is confounded by technical and inspection biases. So any correlation analysis with degree of proteins have to be done very carefully. And finally, if you wanna look for connectivity trends in networks, I think the best way to do this really in this empirical way is to use degree controlled randomized networks. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this webinar and um, I'll give the mic back to AJ. So I'll read the questions out. Um, so the first question here is, are there any issues from inadvertently using co-complex interactions uh, from these databases instead of direct or binary interactions in computational studies? So if I understand this question correctly, you're asking whether there's um, any cases where you like shouldn't use co-complex data because you might get to wrong conclusions. Um, then the only way I could think about this is that, you know, if you really need direct protein interaction data, we've been seeing that, you know, a little less than 50% of the interactions of co-complex interactions are direct interactions. So, um, I think that that's really important to know and that might influence a little bit whether you want to use co-complex data or not. I hope I got this question right. Okay, so the next one is, can HURI be used as a gold standard to compare the interactions we see in a disease state versus control? I believe it reports the interactions we will find in a controlled individual. Ah, um, well, we, we see HURI, yeah, as a, first reference map uh, because it's a, it's a data set of possible protein interactions. So physically, you know, physical protein interactions. Um, and if you now wanna look at what's happening in a disease state, then you can filter HURI um, if the disease is caused by a loss of function of the protein, you can see which interactions are removed from the network. Um, what we've also looked into was for example, um, in some other diseases like cancer, um, sometimes proteins are upregulated or ectopically expressed. Um, and you can then still look into our network because it's independent of the actual expressions of the proteins in the cellular context. So you can filter who we're using an expression data set to then see which proteins might be acting with your upregulated protein in the specific context we have expression data for. So yes, you can in that sense use it as a kind of reference and then overlaying other information about your disease states kind of filter it to the network that's most likely to exist in your disease state. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what proportion of the PPIs detected in Hurie? Uh, have been validated by a distinct methodology? Um, yes, so um, the pipeline that we uh, employ to, to make the Huobi data set is that we have first these two hybrid to make the screens, and then we randomly sample, um, I think we randomly sampled more than 3,000 interactions of the 50,000 interactions, and we tested them in two other binary uh, protein interaction detection assays that work on million cells. They are called MAPID and GPCA. And we not only tested um, 
the 3000 proteins in these other assays, we also randomly sampled uh, literature curated protein interactions that had at least two different methods or uh, evidence types. And we also added a kind of negative data set. So where we just randomly pair proteins, you know, um, as a circuit for non-interacting uh, proteins. So we had these three types of um, pairs of proteins that we tested in these orthogonal assays. And what we observed was that the Huri interactions be tested at the same rate as literature curated protein interactions under conditions where only 1% of the random pairs scored positive. And so we use this kind of approach to validate the whole data set because it gives an estimate for a kind of comparable quality, let's say, to literature curated protein interaction data. So we say that our data is as detectable or reproducible as interactions with at least two different evidences or two different methods or two different publications uh, that are curated in, from the literature. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, how can I create this kind of network of interaction before detecting the shortest distance? Can I use amino acids data to compute the network? I think the best ways to get protein interaction data is to go to resources like Intact, String, or BioGrid. Or if you want, you can try like these systematically generated data sets. But I really think that I didn't have time to go into this, but I really think that experimentally determined interaction data still is of the best quality. You can also try to predict your interactions, but so far what I've been seeing is you will have a very high false positive rate. And if you wanna do predictions on your network and your network is, is predicted already, you'll make predictions on predictions and that's usually not such a good idea. I hope that answers your question. All right, uh, next question is, uh, does URI provide any context specific protein interaction data such as in healthy brain cells, et cetera? Yeah, so it also relates back to one of the first questions. So HURI as such is independent of any cellular context, right? Um, it, it just means that these two proteins can interact with each other. And then in the publication with HURI, we actually showed that if you integrate HURI with different data sets, for example, um, localization data to see which proteins are co-occurring in the same compartment, or if you integrate it with tissue expression data, you can kind of um, you know, infer the subnetwork of these possible protein interactions that might exist in the cellular context you want to study. And that was kind of useful. And that's the best circuit that we can have at the moment to generate a context-specific protein interaction network. Okay. Uh, so next one is, uh, are there any disease specific protein interaction database, how accurate, how accurate it is to use tools like string and gene MAI, MAIA for PPI? Disease specific um, protein interactions. Um, so I, I don't think that, I mean, some, I think in some studies, people measure protein interactions in a certain disease context, but I'm not sure this is actually captured in the curation process. What I know is that INTACT, for example, also curates um, the effect of mutations on protein interactions that have been experimentally measured. So that would be like a way to get disease influenced interactions, if it, this disease is caused by mutation that then influences or perturbs a protein interaction or might even lead to a gain of interaction. Um, yeah, the other mode um, again of how a disease can modulate, um, well, there's a third mode I actually haven't thought of, which is pathogens, uh, right? That can also perturb the network and create a disease context. There are databases that, um, are dedicated to uh, curate, for example, uh, host virus protein interactions, which might be another way to kind of get at a network in a particular disease context. 
Other than that, it would come back to the cancer example that I gave. If it's based on just up or down regulation of proteins, maybe the best way would be to again integrate the, the reference network with gene expression data from the cancer sample to see which proteins are expressed. And those are the ones that could also interact, you know, if you see them interacting in the reference network. Okay, so next question is a bit uh, long one. So I think it has two or more parts. I'll read it out. Mm -hmm. I usually believe that the PPIs contain a lot of noise or fal false positives. For example, querying, querying the proteins from a high throughput study will return a network with many interactions, which are not essentially useful. What are the different methods to denoise the network or remove false positives? If during this we lose the true interactions, how would we be certain that the remaining ones are relevant and we are not missing another important interactions that does occur and is curated, but is removed due to filtering or denoising? Yes, uh, thank you for the question actually, because I had thought about putting this into the presentation, but then I thought like, well, it's not merely maybe onto the topic, but of course it is an important question that we all ask about when we work with protein interaction data. And of course, as since I was part of you know, mapping the HUI data set, um, we of course thought a lot about false positives in the data set. And so what um, I wanna give also a long answer to a long question, if I may, since we have still time, right? Um, so what I didn't talk about is that we have all these different protein interaction assays and um, whether an interaction is detected in a certain assay or not, depends a lot on how the assay is set up, right? We have often these fusion constructs, they can interfere with the interaction like sterically, for example, or the interaction might need uh, a post nutritional modification, which wouldn't happen in the cellular system, which you express your proteins, or maybe you don't express the right isoform, you know, maybe you need another isoform that actually mediates the interaction. There's a lot of reasons why every protein interaction assay can only for technical reasons detect a subset of all possible interactions. This actually has been studied in detail in the Vidal lab and they found, for example, by taking five or so different binary protein interaction assays that they all just find about 20% of the tested known protein interaction. So the sensitivity of all protein interaction assays is low, okay? However, as of all other experiments or methods, the same as this NGS or whatever, you know, you can do it sloppy and then you'll get false positives and you can do it accurately and then you will not get false positives. And what my um, sort of experience is also looking at the Bioplex data set, for example, um, is that, you know, these are the people who run these assays at this high throughput. They, they are really experts in their field. They have worked on these assays for many, many years. And they do these experiments in a very controlled way um, to really you know, have the false positive rate being down. As I was saying, 1%, for example, in this validation step that I explained earlier. So uh, long story short, I generally believe that um, Sensitivity is low in protein interaction data. You miss a lot of interactions, but the specificity generally is high. Um, and that is also why, you know, you see a small overlap, for example, between different interaction data sets. It's because they each of them only capture a small fraction of the interactome, um, why we see a small overlap. And it's not because they are full of false positives that you don't see an overlap or not a big overlap. So um, this is just based on sort of technical aspects in terms of false positives being interpreted as two proteins are reported to interact, but they don't actually interact physically. Many people also talk about false positives in the context of functional relevance. Um, because um, 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 in these two hybrids, you express two proteins out of their context and they might interact, but maybe that they will never act in in interact in reality with each other. Um, and we don't call them false positives because it's not what the essay can, can tell you. We're not measuring in a functional context. 
And when we come back to the cancer example, you know, I, I wouldn't remove these interactions from the data set that might never uh, in physiological conditions interact because they may do so in a, in a pathological context um, where um, a protein suddenly is ectopically expressed and then therefore might find new interaction partners. So if you wanna get an interaction data set with functionally relevant interactions for your question, then integrate it with gene expression data, for example, or protein expression data to kind of reduce it to the interactions that might be most likely in the functional context that you want to study. Oh, I'm constantly getting a call from someone. I'm sorry, that was distracting a little bit. <laughs> uh, so next question is, uh, thank you for the informative talk. I want to know how to select any protein interaction database for interactome data. Do we take multiple PPI database and fetch the interactome data individually from them? Yeah, I think I could give an entire other talk on this topic. <laughs> um, it depends a little bit what kind of interaction data you want again, which is also one of the points I was trying to make, right? Um, and whether you want to do all analyses offline using your own code or whether you're trying to use um, features, analysis tools that the website offers you already. So I found, for example, that String is a database that offers a lot of analysis tools, visualization tools already um, on in the internet, uh, which is nice. But String contains experimental data and lots of predicted protein interactions. So if you, you know, don't want predicted protein interactions, you have to make sure you filter them out first, which you can also do online. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking at getting as much as possible experimental information for the interactions, because for example, you might wanna reproduce one interaction in your lab, then string might not be a good choice. And then I'd rather go to Intact, which has a really, really good um, curation standard and depth of curation, where you will be able to get all the experimental data um, out uh, from the table from Intact that you know you need or that was that defines how the interaction was actually detected. So um, yeah, so this is really a brief answer with like, two maybe aspects you can consider uh, where you want to go to to which resource. The next question is I think it's a bit uh, speculative question. Uh, what uses do you envisage for the PPI? with the new single cell technologies becoming more and more popular nowadays? Yes, uh, that's a nice question, actually. So as I was briefly, very briefly showing, so we used the Huri data set to look at tissue networks, right? And, and seeing how specifically expressed proteins um, interact with each other or not in the, in the tissue. But of course, this is a very rough circuit. I mean, what's a tissue, right? Um, the tissue exists of many different cell types. And I was already back then thinking I would have loved to actually rather use like cell type expression data, which back then wasn't really available yet. But now with single cell data, I think there's more and more really nice expression data sets out there that will allow you to better filter the reference interactome towards the interactions that might actually exist in a given cell type or even single cell. So that, that's maybe really the, the nice aspect of it, given that we still don't have this method, right? That I was telling at the beginning of my talk to just capture the interactome in your sample. So therefore there has to be this inference by taking a reference map and then filtering it using expression data. Yeah, so the next question is, is a bit related to that one. Uh, can you comment on how the subcellular locations of the protein complexes may impact protein-protein interaction analysis. May impact protein interaction anal analysis or detection? Mm. I'm not really seeing how it can impact the analysis. I mean, um, if you do wanna look at, you know, protein interactions or complexes in a specific compartment like the nucleus, you can try to overlay the reference interactome with localization data. Um, uh, when it comes to detection, 
then yes, um, we depending on the method, we can see that um, some interactions happening in some compartments are maybe not as easily detected as interactions in other compartments. For example, for yeast to hybrid, the interaction has to happen in the nucleus because it has to activate the expression of the reporter gene. And so in the assay, we are kind of helping the proteins to locate to the nucleus uh, by adding a nuclear localization signal to them. But we also see, for example, that transmembrane proteins and their interactions are um, not very well detected uh, by yeast to hybrid, for example. Yeah. I hope I answered the question. Okay, uh, so the next one is, I think it's about uh, the level of expression of protein and its function. So does it, uh, does it then mean that scientists are assuming that highly expressed genes or proteins have more functions or influence? What if a minimally expressed gene actually indicates the normal or right function and then high expression to indicate a disease state or abnormality? Yeah, good question. I think primarily that we see these, these biases that um, are highly that highly expressed genes are more highly studied is because they're more easily detected, you know, using mass spectrometry, for example. Um, or then if you do a pull on invest on blood, you know, if the interaction partner is more highly expressed, you're more easily going to detect it in the blood. And what we're also seeing is that more highly expressed proteins tend to be tend to more easily fold and be more stable, right? Because apparently the cell needs them in higher quantities and can't afford that these proteins are like hard to fold and, and maintain. And then therefore they are more easy to work in the lab at the bench. They're more easy to, um, to transfect, uh, to purify, et cetera. So that's why I think we have this, this study bias for more highly expressed proteins. I don't think that they are therefore going to be necessarily more functionally relevant. Um, I'm sure there will be um, less abundant proteins that are also, you know, very important and quite some disease genes are not highly expressed. Um, and yet when they're lost, we have a severe phenotype. So we'll take this, this last one. Uh, could we also use wholesale cross-linking experiment coupled with mass spec to search for interactions more broadly? I think it's more experimental. Uh, yeah, uh, good point. Exactly. That is, you know, at least in theory, I was also hoping that this method could maybe get us closer towards capturing the interactome from a given cellular state. I'm actually in my lab doing experiments with this, trying to do this um, in a lower scale. I think we are not there yet. Um, I think the sensitivity is still very low. Um, but maybe you are probably because you're asking a question there are some interesting studies, you know, and actually I don't think that we have explored the data well enough yet to know really how sensitive it is, which biases are there. Does cross-linking, you know, tend to detect some interactions, not others? This I think is a open questions and they're really interesting to go after. Um, but yeah, short answer is we're not quite there yet, but my hope would be that this would be one of the methods maybe getting us there.